Welcome to another episode of Mind Maxing Podcasts. And I'm delighted to be here with Pat Malone, who I've known for many, many years. And Pat is at Stony Brook, uh, SUNY Stony Brook in, in New York. And she is the Associate Vice President of Professional Development. And I enjoy Pat's humorous and very positive views on how she's able to get things done. Um, Pat's, Pat's a real doer and, and uh, she's a really creative problem solver and she's been able to navigate a very large institution to really uh, create some movement and, and positive direction for Stony Brook. So with that, uh, it's been quite a year, 2020, Pat, and uh, I'll be interested in hearing uh, some of your reflections on the last year. Oh my goodness, Lee. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and it's a pleasure to be working with you through this year of craziness. Um, my reflections start back a year ago when we were all together in New Orleans, and we were talking about emerging on new online strategies and how to kind of get the institutions on board. Well, in a short phrase, it happened very quickly this year as a result of COVID. And so the blur of February into March is one that sort of stands out, I think, for all of us. It's kind of like, where were you when it moved into a whole different world? But you know, it's been it's been a bittersweet year on many, many levels. There have been some unbelievable losses and difficulties that we've all encountered um, personally, professionally, and in our country and in the world. And I think that has very much colored the way that educators and people in our type of work have responded to the circumstances, meaning that we were called to action very early on in a way that many others were not in the academic world. Um, in working with professional and higher education learners and the undergraduate learners at the institution, moving into platforms that allowed for continuity and connection amidst the chaos and the uncertainty moved us into a paradigm where every single moment was uncertain and we became comfortable with the fact that what we could say in one moment might easily change in the next moment. And we all had to agree to that, if nothing else. So it took a huge amount of energy and insight and stamina. And I think many of us were incredibly invigorated by the community that we created amongst ourselves at institutions to respond and also the community that we were serving. So there was a huge amount of influx of support and energy from that, but a, a tremendous fatigue at the same time. So I think it was a year of manner, managing our energy and our insight and our innovation on a daily basis. Um, I think that this is a year that will stand out in a way that disrupted higher education in ways that none of us wanting to move things in a little different direction or a little more innovatively could have ever foreseen. So we have benefited from this. And I think we have very different looking institutions and leaders at institutions than we did a year ago. And that's a good thing because we knew that there were the rumblings of things we needed to address early on, but there's sort of been a call to action through the pandemic that is playing out in so many different ways. So it's, it's, we're still spinning from it, but I think we're catching our breath now. I actually do think we're starting to catch our breath. It reminds me of, of uh, the adage, the only thing that's constant is change. And, and uh, you know, that's a really interesting that you're, you're, you and your team uh, were able to embrace that. What are, what are some of the things you did to either create that mindset or maintain that mindset of, of embracing um, the reality that, you know, what was a constant or what was something that was certain one week might have been different the next week. What, what did you do to help people with that mindset? I, th I think we had to address the fact that we needed to check in with everybody on sort of an emotional and a personal level uh, to some degree, pretty consistently to make sure everyone was all right because we were all frightened on, on different levels. We were frightened for different reasons. So, so doing that was really important in creating a camaraderie and sort of a safe space to then do our work together. But a few of the things that we did that I'm incredibly taken with were looking outward to the communities that we were serving. And in, in professional education, higher education, especially in this professional continuing education area, there are so many different moving communities that we're addressing at the same time in doing our work. So one of the things that we were able to do is check in with those larger communities and start to create response mechanisms for them 
that may have looked a little different than we would have done before, but that actually created connectivity and support. Uh, overnight, we took a, a center that we had just sort of launched that was supposed to address superintendent memberships and school district memberships and big symposiums at the university and AI and really connectivity and had to flip it to how P12 teachers could teach remotely because that's all that was anybody in the educational world in that field was thinking of. And we were able to pull together an army of experts and overnight, literally, I'm telling you, from Friday afternoon to Monday morning, launch 44 workshops, community service free, that were subscribed to by 3,000 3, people throughout the country and outside of the country. And um, we were very, very proud of that. And it created a responsiveness and everybody was giving back something in this venue. And it created the platform for this new center that looked very different than the reason that we did create it. And it's now very involved in statewide assessments of P12 learning and digital implications and economic equity and all that stuff that's just so center stage for us right now. So that's one area. Another area that we launched was an advocacy group for human services and human service support providers that were running adult and group homes for adults and children with disabilities were functioning as essential workers, but never deemed as such. And the impacts across them in terms of safety, environment, PPE, budget cuts were just beyond heartbreaking. So we coalesced that group and got the ear of people in the Department of Labor and Health and Human Services and the Suffolk County executives and other elected officials and created a large advocacy movement for them to be reviewed as essential workers and to receive some type of support. So. That's something that's in process right now, and we did get some funding for them. So that was a very important piece. And then the other piece was being very focused on the student and the faculty experience in this world in terms of the quality and the impact of teaching and learning. And we're very excited that we've launched and through some of the supports that you've offered us and, and others, a student service experience that has tremendously played out in people selecting our institution because of our response on a human level to students. And faculty have felt that and are now pitching in and are starting to create tremendous experiences and impact in a way that we're realizing that our nurturing of those that come to our institution and their continuity and their safety and well being in the educational arena is the conversation everybody's a part of. So again, we created another community within our community in doing what we're doing even more effectively. And it's playing out in increased enrollments and engagement. That's great. Everyone appreciates being heard and being seen. Uh, they really do. And uh, so this has been, uh, you know, like you said, it's been 12 months, it's been a, been a while. And, uh, and you know, plans are being made and, and new things are happening. And like you said, catching your breath. So what, what in the next six to nine months um, do you see in a concrete way happening differently that you're planning on doing or in the process of executing? Or you think higher ed is doing or needs to be doing in the next six to nine months? I think for the most part, higher ed really knows that it needs to be implementing technology, student service, faculty engagement and quality to remain sustainable, to compete, to retain students, to attract students. Health and safety is foremost. So when we're looking at the undergraduate experience and on-campus life, that's really the mantra for all those in student services and academic admissions. Make it safe, make it real, bring it back to life again. We have learned tremendously that that engagement, that in-person engagement is critical to our learning and our innovation and our very well-being. And that technology can be fabulous, but we need to start to reposition the use of technology and really yearn to go back to that interaction. But on the higher front in terms of professional and continuing education, I think, Lee, now more than ever, the need to really integrate economic development, workforce, and higher education in accessible and agile models is center stage. And how does that translate? I think every one of us has a regional economy that's been affected in very similar ways and very different ways, depending upon where we are located. So I know that our institution is very committed to enhancing the economic development and sort of as Mary Walshock said many years ago, the DNA of our region into how we approach higher education in our role as a research university. 
So I see that moving on steroids. I see in the Long Island region and in the New York state and in the Northeast, offshore wind and climate and environmental impacts are center. And I think that we'll be creating a much more robust ecosystem in that area on many levels from trade and technician to data analysis and environmental impacts and business analysis. I also think I know on the Long Island area and any others can translate it to their regions, our agriculture and our farms and our wineries out east and the beauty of the out east area into New York City creates an incredible corridor about food and farm to restaurant. And what's happened in terms of restaurants delivering and sending out and starting to use internet to market their products and shifting from what was one venue to a totally different venue. So I think it's really important to start to look at what some of those strategies can be. So I've convened a very large, uh, robust network from top restaurateurs and wineries and farms to manufacturers and producers to work with our manufacturing consortium on an ecosystem in food. And I think that's just like one of several, the human services area, again, the hit that they've taken with healthcare in general as a larger landscape is, is also important. So I think the revitalization of what the economy looks like and where the, there are jobs and how employers can redefine who they are and work with us to create a new platform for themselves is truly the next step. And that's got to happen in the short term. We have to be looking at stimulus money and support systems to be very agile in how we get a hold of those that have lost jobs or employers that are seeking support and connect those dots in a much faster way than we have before. And in long term, weaving in and out of sort of that, you know, 60, 90 year relationship with higher learning and education is going to have to be much more aggressive and focused and accessible. So I think we've got short term kind of getting the health back to our regions through what we can do. And then long term, making sure that we thread that through moving forward. Well, I think you are in the right job at a school of professional development because that connection with application and, and the reality of a community um, and as the community's needs have changed so dramatically in this situation in the last year and a half and being able to respond to that is is uh, something that a school of professional development can, can really do. Uh, not all do that, but uh, I, I do think you're well positioned to be able to do that. So that's fantastic. So as we think about, you know, a further future, um, vaccines are all out and, and so forth in the next year or so, um, you know, the 2022 and beyond, you know, as you mentioned, there's been some changes that were happening before COVID, um, even well before COVID, but have been escalated or accelerated. Um, what are some of your thoughts about how things are going to be different in the longer term future? I think in the longer term future, um, in, in our institutions on the undergraduate level, we're gonna to start to filter through technology and hybrid models much more effectively, maximizing our use of interaction and learning opportunities with our space constraints, because we all know bricks and mortar has been an issue for all of us going forward. So I think there's a new platform for looking at space considerations and ways to be creative. So we've broken through that barrier. I do think there's gonna be the need to return to teams and collaboration and in-person spaces and shared spaces. But I do think it'll be done a little differently. And I think that health and safety protocols will be center stage in a way they've never been before and will continue to be so for a long time. You know, we've learned, we know this could happen again and we're gonna be careful about how we do it. Mm -hmm. I think that there's gonna be a huge platform for really looking at what diversity, equity and inclusivity means and how we truly create equity and make equity be something integrated through everything we do, as opposed to an equity initiative. So I do think we have a lot of work to do on our multiple layers of relationships in that space. And I expect that there'll be some incredibly creative collaborations and movements in that direction. And it'll change the content and the delivery and the whole feeling of higher education Five years from now, we'll go back and go, whoa, I can't believe we didn't do that sooner. So I think that's a really important piece. And I also think for higher education, professional learning, whether it be in degree granting or professional education arenas, we need to be very, very careful about 
the brand and the content and the quality of what we do. We need to be keeping our content and our experience up to date for students because I do believe that our, our students will become even more finely tuned to selecting the right institution and the right match for them. And the arena has gotten so much larger. It isn't just an online and local or 90 miles away or across the country, it's global. And it's cropping up and down in terms of new programs and opportunities. So we, we really have to keep on it. We've got to be very fine tuned. Well, that's, those are great, great thoughts to think about, Pat. And I, uh, you know, I think the supply, if you'll pardon the term, for, of different providers of educational experiences is only increasing. Um, and as we know, there's a, a, a demographic dip in the next couple of years that's reaching its, its low point. Um, so those two things together is going to require going to require some creativity and different approaches. So, mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for today. And any closing thoughts or comments or things you'd like to say to add on? Yeah, I think I think that we have all, despite the limitations and the um, sheltering in place that we've done in all different ways and shapes and forms. It's been incredible, and I've spoken with colleagues across the country from many different backgrounds, the sense of community and connection that we've found, the way that we've actually been able to transcend the distances through Zoom, through this type of a venue and speaking to each other. And I think that we all realize that we value very much those connections that keep us anchored in our lives, whatever they are, mm -hmm. and have had a chance to sort of revisit the importance of that in the context of our work. So I do think that we're moving forward with sort of a revisiting our humanness and our sameness and how we can solve some of these very big problems together. So it's an opportunity for us. Well, thank you, Pat Malone, and thanks for the opportunity to, opportunity to, to, to connect. Um, this has been great today, and, and this has been another edition of Mind Maxing Podcasts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee.